we are here to talk about creating realistic dialogue in your writing. And so the first question often is, why does dialogue matter? It matters because you are helping your speakers speak. You're helping them say whatever it is, tell the story that you're trying to tell. And so the more realistic they are, the more believable and credible your writing is going to be. So you could argue that dialogue is the foundation of telling your stories, because if we follow the guidance of showing rather than telling, dialogue is a great way to do that because you not only are telling the story, but you're showing how the characters interact with each other, how they react to each other, they react to what each other says and things of that nature. So it's really a critically important piece of a good creative piece. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today comes from a book called The Lie That Tells the Truth. You see a picture of it there on the screen. And it was written by John Dufresne, who is a professor, but he has written uh, and published multiple successful novels. Um, if you want to get started with John Dufresne, probably the best one is one called Louisiana Power and Light. That's his first one. And it's just terrific. It's a little dark, so be aware. But he is a terrific writer and he does a great job with dialogue. And so I, and when I first started looking into this uh, quite some time ago, I was really interested in what he had to say about developing dialogue, since that's one of what I consider to be his strengths as a writer. And he bases his approach to dialogue um, on the idea that scene is at the heart of story and dialogue is often at the heart of scene. You add to that that as characters speak, they become. And you can see why it becomes so critical to the success of your piece of writing that your characters speak authentically. So let's talk about how we can make dialogue authentic. Well, fundamentally, by listening to your speakers. And something that you may hear from time to time when authors talk about their characters is you'll often hear them say that their characters spoke to them. Matter of fact, um, going all the way back to 1899, when Kate Chopin wrote The Awakening, she was interviewed afterward because the female character was pretty controversial because she makes choices that were not acceptable for women in the late 1800s. And so if you're interested in that kind of thing, The Awakening by Kate Chopin is a terrific book. But um, the author, Kate Chopin, said later in an interview that if she had known that Edna, who was her main character, was going to do the things she did, she might not have created her at all. I'm paraphrasing, but because she didn't listen to the speech, she did, excuse me, listen to the speaker and let the story develop the way the character tried to be going, she ended up being surprised at how it ended. Um, similarly, Alice Walker talks about the fact that when she was writing much of her work, but particularly um, The Color Purple, that she sat down in front of the computer and started writing what the characters were saying in her head. So all of this goes to the idea of listening to your speakers and letting them evolve in an authentic way, in an organic way, if you will. Um, so these then are some tips that will help you to develop authentic dialogue. Um, these come from Dufresne, so just want to be, you know, uh, upfront that this is borrowed material. This isn't original to me by a long shot. One of the things that he talks about extensively is avoiding using dialogue tags whenever you possibly can. And when we talk about a dialogue tag, we mean things like Joe said, Jane asked, uh, Mary questioned, things like that. He says instead of using those dialogue tags, let the character's actual speech emote and provide the tone rather than having a narrator tag do it. So it's going to be more authentic if it's coming from, if the tone and the emotion and the reactions are coming from the character rather than being communicated through a so-and-so set. He also suggests over, avoiding the overuse of adjectives and adverbs to indicate tone and emotion. And in fact, I would go a step further and say that in general, whether you're writing dialogue or whether you're writing exposition, it's preferable to put the action in your verbs. Choose good, strong verbs and try and avoid using adjectives and adverbs because those are, again, you're telling uh, the, the reader rather than showing the reader. So if you have to describe how the words were spoken by using adjectives or adverbs, the words may not be doing their job and you wanna think about potentially changing those words. 
you typically want to speak, place the speaker's name or their pronoun, like he or she, in the first speaker attribution. So in other words, it would be he said, da da da. Mary, Mary said, da da da. So that's going to follow the way we expect English syntax to be arranged. Um, he then talks about how you can avoid overusing narrator tags. And usually you're only going to need them occasionally if your conversation is taking place between two people. So you can start out by telling the reader, well, it's a rainy, cold day in Texas. I, matter of fact, I said that wrong. John said it's a rainy, cold day in Texas. So now we know who's speaking. So assuming we know who's in the scene, the next person to speak is obviously going to be the second person. And as the dialogue goes back and forth, you won't need those narrator tags very often. Just throw one in often enough to make sure the reader can keep up with who's speaking. He also suggests that if multiple people are part of the conversation, it can become confusing unless you have a narrator tag on every line. And that gets honestly kind of clunky. So ask yourself if you have multiple people who are part of the conversation, if the third person or any other people really add to the scene. If they don't, Dufresne says, send them out for coffee, get rid of those guys, let them come back and talk again later so that you can focus on the conversation between the two people without having to disrupt it with all the narrator tags. Okay, so then uh, we talk a bit about how to make dialogue sound real. If it becomes too long, try inserting some speech through indirect discourse by reporting what a character said. Um, you don't wanna do that too much because then it becomes it shifts from showing to telling but you if the dialogue runs on too long if you suddenly are writing hamlet's you know monologue then you're liable to lose the attention of your reader um and i'm fixing to i, I just did what i'm fixing to say you shouldn't do try to omit hesitations on the part of your your speakers so things like um ah uh, well you know try and leave those out because even though they may be realistic representations of speech because as we know, a lot of people use those, it isn't going to advance the reader's understanding of your character. Um, also, avoid having your characters repeat themselves. If they have to retell what the narrator already said, the question becomes, why is the narrator telling it? Why isn't the speaker telling it? You also want to strike a balance between formal and informal language. If the language is too informal or too formal, excuse me, the dialogue can sound stilted, but if it's too informal, some readers are going to be put off by that. Um, characters don't speak alike, just like when you talk to your friends, they're not going to express themselves in the same way that you do. They're not going to speak alike in your work. They also aren't going to sound like your third person narrator. Your third person narrator is typically going to sound as if they're observing from a distance. And you don't want your characters to seem distant to your readers. You want to think about dialogue rather than monologue. If a character talks for more than five or six sentences, it's probably too much and you need to break it up. Keep in mind, too, that what is not said is often at least as important as what is said. And you can communicate that by having the, the speaker make a move or pick something up or look in a particular direction give them something to do maybe they pick up their coffee and take a sip while they're considering their response but have them do something and that's going to help to communicate the situation um, keep in mind that speech provides both concealment and revelation you may be able to tell that the reader is excuse me that the speaker is hiding something or that they have just revealed something but maybe they're not making a big deal about it so keep in mind that your speech can be used to reveal things that they might not come right out and say in so many words. So it goes back to that idea that what's not said may be at least as important as what the speaker does say. Then think about whether you want your speakers to be trustworthy or not. Um, readers tend to trust speakers who are concrete. They become skeptical of speakers who generalize or who are vague or who just kind of ramble around. And maybe that's what you want. Maybe you don't want your speaker to be um, trustworthy or a reliable narrator. But these are things that you want to consider as you're developing your dialogue. Some additional tips that Dufresne provides for providing more authentic dialogue. Read your dialogue aloud after you write it. And if you feel uncomfortable with that, go and you think, oh my gosh, somebody's going to hear me or it's not ready for prime time. 
Go into the bathroom, turn on the shower and sit there and read it. Nobody's going to hear you, but you're going to get a good sense of how effective your dialogue is by trying to speak it as if you were having a conversation. Another thing that's extremely helpful is go and listen to people talking in real settings. Mm -hmm. If the setting can be close to the one you're creating, that's great. But if not, just listening to people talk to each other is going to be helpful. Write down what you hear them say, not what you want them to say. And uh, in some circumstances, I would even recommend recording it so you can refer back to it. But that's something you want to be kind of careful about because some people will get understandably upset about that. Ultimately, you want to give yourself tools to practice mimicking the type of speech that you see and, and observe. Okay, You do want to avoid using your dialogue to provide exposition, but you want to use dialogue to move the plot along to show the reader what kind of character they're listening to. Okay, Remember that your dialogue is not small talk. Ideally, it should always do at least one of these things. It should depict some kind of change. It should reveal character, something about the speaker, presumably. It should advance the plot or it should express the theme. So ultimately, this is going to wrap up by saying, don't describe dialogue, show it. If you're telling about a conversation, try to revamp it so that it becomes an interactive conversation, because that's ultimately going to be more authentic. It's going to be more engaging for your reader. Um, do frame and actually I take that back. This actually comes from a different site and, and you may have noticed there's uh, citations at the bottom of each slide so you can go to the sources if you wish to. This comes from a website that is from screencraft.org and it actually uh, is focused more on people who are writing plays or screenplays, but the the uh, suggestions for dialogue I think are pretty useful and they start with one that you know we love and hate cut the fluff because we tend to write stuff and then look at it later and be like, oh, that's too much. But when we first write it, we may really fall in love with it. And you want to try and avoid falling in love with your the speech that your characters have until you know that it's what you need. So if the speech isn't serving a purpose, if it's slowing the story down, cut it, cut it ruthlessly. Make sure that everything is said for a reason. And at least to yourself, be able to articulate what's the reason that this person said this thing. OK, they also suggest going what they call off the nose. OK, you don't want your character to say exactly what they think or what they feel. So in other words, they don't have to be right on the nose. Therefore, when you do say exactly what they mean, you're bringing the subtext to the surface and oversimplifying the uh, the whole situation for the reader. Also, make your talking heads do something. Make them ride a bike, have a fist fight, play ping pong. And I just realized we have a typo here and I'm going to fix it. There we go. Um, play ping pong, have a drinking contest. You can have them do all kinds of things, but if you have them doing something as they're talking, that helps keep the audience with you because they not only are looking for what the speaker is saying, but what the speaker is doing and how the speaker is interacting with um, other characters in the scene. You wanna strive to make characters sound different from each other. You can vary your speech pattern, word choice, sentence rhythm, sentence structure, rhythm, regional dialect, speech frequency. In other words, maybe it's somebody who only speaks once in a while, but when they speak, it's important. And the reader picks up on that and goes, oh, okay, well, this is, this is Joe speaking and he doesn't say things very often. So if he's saying something that's probably important, I should probably pay attention to it. Finally, delete, delete, delete. And we said this at the beginning of this slide, we're gonna say it again. Cut dialogue that you don't need. Don't fall in love with it. And remember ultimately that actions are going to speak louder than words. So what we did in our live session is we then looked at a segment of dialogue. I borrowed this segment from Dufresne's book um, because it has a number of the things in here that he suggests not doing. And I'm just going to point out a couple. I don't want to go through and, you know, and, and beat you all over the head with all the little details, but things like she smiles, okay? Um, maybe what she says could indicate that she's smiling rather than using smiles as your dialogue tag, okay? Um, Dennis acts nervous. Ha show him being nervous rather than her watching him act nervous. Um, again, she asks thoughtfully. Uh, she could have just said rough day and he's silent he doesn't know where to begin so then she changes the subject but there's several things here that you may see that 
are things that you could change to improve this dialogue. So if dialogue is something that you're working with, it might be a useful activity to spend a few minutes looking at this from an editor's perspective and saying, okay, what could I do to make this better? So that's there for you if you, if you are interested. Finally, there's a list of suggested resources. Um, these are resources that I like for a variety of reasons. Um, they're color coded because the ones in yellow talk specifically about the process of writing. They're process oriented. The rest of them are more uh, focused on grammar and style, and they all can be extremely useful, but I, I wanted you to know kind of what the fundamental difference was between them. And I believe that most, if not all of these books are available in uh, the Colin Library. And if they're not, most of them are available very inexpensively through someplace like Amazon. So um, that wraps up our session. I'm sorry that we didn't get to talk live because it was really interesting to hear other people's perspectives, but I hope you found this helpful and uh, good luck with your writing. Thanks for dropping by.